Nope. I'm going to try to share it. Yeah, still never sure when this starts. Maybe I should watch one of these episodes and um, know exactly when you guys <laughs> get to start hearing us. Uh, Will, I don't know. He never gave us an excuse. He's just not going to be with us tonight. He said there's no way he's going to make it. Yeah. So, And for some reason, my Facebook is, I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to share this. You know, I try, I've been trying to share it every week. But for the last like week, my Facebook shows me like three posts, the same posts, just in different orders. Um, I think something's wrong. But anyway, so I guess I'm not going to be sharing it to my friends tonight. Sorry, guys. You should have already shared it. But that's no what I'm that I I can't because I just see the same like three to five posts over and over. And I don't even get the notifications that we've scheduled this. Like, it's just strange. So anyway, if you're not watching, you should be watching. So how you doing, John? Oh, it's uh, trying to make some of these colors go away. Hey, I'm going to leave that, even though there's a little highlight back there of the one screen I'm on. Uh, dainty little wrists. Somebody was talking about that this week. Uh, that's um, very strange. <laughs> excuse me. Um. Oh. I don't know. I think I'm back into the, the real world. Um, I'm I am back, not. Not at all. I'm back not in my studio. All. I mean, nothing. It's been very uneventful for me car-wise. Um, Must last, be nice. I'm trying to even... I can't even say traffic annoyed me. No, I've been I'm really good car-wise. What you got going on? I, I, let yeah, me, come come, we'll come try skip. to drive. Come come try to drive around Bowling Green. See how that works for you. Um, I have a feeling that was like being at Hilton Head. What was that? Four or five years ago, um, right after they had Hilton Head Concours, right after their um, hurricane. Um, um, I know I saw the uh, Corvette Museum Facebook post and that. Um, you know, you said. Fortunately, personally, you came through it pretty well. The museum came through it. Now you said minor damage or something, maybe a power outage. Maybe I'm wrong. Minor damage. Well, minor damage. You know, nothing. We, we were fortunate uh, uh, on the museum <laughs> side of the street. Nothing like a sinkhole in a main hall or anything? Yeah, that, right. We No no collections were damaged, <laughs> uh, but we, you know, buildings take damages and, you know, they're minor. They're they're repairable. And, uh, you know, we, we had to be closed for two days. That was mainly because of power outages. That's, I mean, we just didn't have power back to the museum. Uh, if, if anyone's listening and, and doesn't know what we're talking about, obviously Bowling Green and, and the western part of Kentucky was struck by severe tornadoes. And uh, it was an interesting weekend, we'll put it that way. They hit about 1.23, I think it was, in the morning on Saturday. And uh, needless to say, I was up for a lot of hours on end and uh, in the museum uh, checking on things. And of course our, everyone knows NCM has a motorsports park, a uh, racetrack across the street. And unfortunately that, that part of our campus took a direct hit from one of the tor tornadoes and uh, did some severe damage to buildings. I'm sure anyone who's, you know, th there's some pictures floating around online of the Holly tower um, and some of the buildings. And it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty rough. Um, it's, it's hard to see that. Um, when you've worked somewhere for multiple years and grown to be part of the family. Um, and I read, or I read, and my dad even mentioned something, you know, my dad's just North of you in Terre Haute. And he was telling me that they got shear winds at, you know, one in the morning or so he slept through it, but they had no damage either. Um, but he said, he, and like I said, I read that, um, uh, the factory got some damage or, Yes, unfortunately, the the same. It appears that the same tornado that uh, hit our motorsports park hit jumped the freeway, uh, I sixty five, and and hit the plant as well, causing some damage. A uh, small fire on the roof from a, I believe it was a gas line hooked up to one of your, you know, the HVAC units essentially. Uh, right. 
and uh, caused a, a gas you know fire in that leak and so yeah there's damage they are already starting to repair the building i mean it's amazing when you're a, a machine and a, a company as large as gm you know that's turning things out they the next day they had equipment there to start working on the building so um you know hopefully hopefully the repairs get done and we get moving along yeah it's kind of um it's not like those of us that have to sit around and wait for the insurance adjuster and wait for, and it just kind of, kind of goes, doesn't it? Yeah, it just, okay. it has to, you know, I mean, that's anytime a, anybody in the automotive world knows whether you're on the collector end or the museum end or whatever end you're on when a, when a plant sits idle, it's a lot of money every hour that's, that's being lost for a company. Uh, so they they want to get it done and moving as fast as possible. Uh, so it has been, you know, the museum gets slightly damaged, the motorsports park gets damaged, the factory gets damaged. Been a rough week automotive world wise um, for I'm going to say sports cars because um, you know no driving gloves normally doesn't comment on the passing of people, but. Um, both Derek and I before the show said, you know, we, we need to mention this because probably one of the unsung heroes of the sports car world, the racing world, um, Hazel Chapman passed away at 94 earlier this week. And I'm going to let Derek tell a little bit, or do you want me to give a narrative on Hazel and why I feel, and then you can talk about some of your personal experiences with Hazel. I never had the opportunity to meet her or anything. We tried many times to get her to come to one of the logs and that, and it just, you know, just never happened. Yeah. I mean, you'd feel free, John. I, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, the reason we want to mention it is because John and I both have connection to Lotus in, in one way or another. Um, and, you know, Hazel's, uh, as John said, unsung hero and, and life of, of being with the Chapman family. So yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you'd fill them in John. Yeah. If it wasn't for Hazel Chapman um, and really her family, Lotus would have never existed. Um, she lent Colin Chapman his first 25 pounds to start a bit, to start Lotus. He, she, he started Lotus in the lockup behind her house. You know, it was, you know, she, so she provided the first building. She provided the first bit of funding for Lotus and was kind of always right there. Now I don't want to discount the Allen brothers or anything. And at some point, or if you really read the history of Lotus and somewhere I've got a interview with the Allen brothers and they, they kind of got, shuffled out of the way in the early days of Lotus, but because of Hazel, Lotus existed. And because Lotus existed, we know the influence that, it, you know, Chapman had on the racing world, uh, air, you know, ground effects, you know, winged cars brought sponsorship to automobile racing really in a big way. Um, you know, just, in innovation after innovation when it came to racing and then innovation after innovation when it came to road cars. And it is, I, I don't even know if Lotus could probably provide you a list of the number of road cars that they've influenced without your knowledge. Yeah. I mean, Azuzu had their little handling by Lotus um, badges on their cars and yeah, Lotus helped with that GM owned Lotus at the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Lotus helped design some of the sound effects that our electric cars have now. Lotus helped, um, I don't know, I, I, I can't even go. Uh, I, I don't even know where to begin with some of the stuff stuff they've done. You know, they've influenced Toyota. The MR2 was kind of a product of Lotus. Corvette has a direct tie to Lotus in the uh, original, well, the C C four ZR one. I wanted to say Thank the original you. ZR one, but we did have the C three ZR one too. So, um, we, I mean, it just what they you know what that company's done, and you know, just been so small and so influential. Um, 
it would not have happened without her. Mm -hmm. And there's no denying that. And I don't think there's any. All right. It, it appears we're having technical difficulties. I'm not sure if John's still on or I'm on. Oh, well, it appears that maybe Derek has the show now. So I'm not sure what John was saying, uh, but obviously we were talking about Hazel Chapman and uh, her life and time of starting, you know, helping Colin Chapman start Lotus and uh, mm -hmm. my experience with with uh ah thank you phil i really don't know john's just texting me so i apologize that this has become a one-man show here john's trying to get back in um uh, but i had the good fortune as as many listeners know to uh, work on the the jim clark type 38 lotus that won the 1965 indy 500 and uh, get that back on track for some of the anniversaries of the indianapolis 500 and the motor speedway um, but while we were doing that, I actually was traveling to England, um, to classic team Lotus and, uh, had the opportunity to meet Hazel and John, I, are you back? I've been, I've been trying to hold the show while you were gone. I heard you. Uh, I'm back. I, I don't know what happened for some reason. Chrome crashed on my end. Uh, I've never had it happen, but all right. It well, we, we have your audio, but you're you're just a locked up video screen. But we do have your audio. Well, we'll we'll live with the audio until I figure out the video. All right. Well, I was just sharing my and as you said, you might have heard it. Um, you know how I got to know Hazel because I didn't know where the show had cut. Um, but in in working on the Type Thirty Eight, uh, got to work closely with Clive Chapman and the, and the crew at, at Classic Team Lotus, and Clive invited myself and um, then curator of transportation at Henry Ford Museum. Bob Casey, uh, mm -hmm. over to his house for dinner and, uh, Clive's house for dinner. And uh, when we got there, it was Clive, his wife, uh, Clive's children and, um, Hazel had shown up and, uh, it was a shock to both myself and Bob to meet Hazel and uh, be able to sit down and have dinner and just listen to her talk about Colin and, uh, you know, the early days of Lotus and everything that they did to keep, you know, to, to bring the company to what it was. And I, I don't know that I've ever met a, a woman quite like Hazel. She, she had a presence about her when she was in a room. And, uh, you know, as, as John said, you know, without Hazel, we probably wouldn't have Lotus. Um, she, she believed in Colin. She believed in what he was trying to do. And, uh, you know, for that, it's, it's a big loss. It's a big loss, but you know, she was an amazing woman. All right. We have video of John back, but just a black sheet behind you. Yeah. I'll, I'll give me a second here. There so. we go. Fortunately, fortunately, Phil let me know I was the one carrying the show. So, yes. well, Phil, Phil's helpful like that. <laughs> so, and, and I told you you were gonna. Didn't I tell you before the show that you were gonna have to carry this one? Yeah, I was. I was carrying. Yeah, that literally was something that was said. Like, hey, you're gonna have to carry the show. I'm like, all right, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, John. I don't know what you were trying to say about you know Hazel when everything fell apart. But uh, you know, I mean, just. As as John led into with some of the history, an amazing woman, and and yeah, you know, one of the other things John and I talked about in the pre-show is you know it's it's sometimes those women uh, of the industry that give so much of themselves to make the industry go forward. I, I was likening uh, Hazel to Bertha Benz and uh, you know, her being really the true support behind Carl and getting the, the, the original Benz patent motor wagon out on the road and testing it. And uh, yeah, I mean, Hazel's just one of those women that are right up there um, in the industry. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to see her, her leave. So. Yeah, um, I'm going to let me play into the Mario Andretti theory, though, in that, you know, I don't know. Is Colin still around? <laughs> you know, if you talk to Mario Andretti, he believes that um, Colin had relocated to South America. 
1982. And well, that's an interesting theory. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's living down there with Elvis and probably with Elvis. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. God, that's twice Elvis has come up with for me in conversation or not in entertaining shows this week. I brought him up in improv class on Monday. Mm-hmm. So, as long as you weren't doing your Elvis impression. I, I, I'm always doing my Elvis impression. I'm a hunk of burning love. <laughs> <laughs> so how come we keep getting these? Uh, I don't want do to call them hackers, the, but. Do, do you know the nice thing about that? No, I don't. You don't get them unless you're popular. Oh, all right. Hey, we're actually making it. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, somebody's got to find you to do that. Well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and after probably one of our practice, I knew what button to hit right away. Yeah. And I really probably. object to her using the name Hutchinson because, you know, I used to live in Hutchinson. Kansas. Well, isn't, isn't yes. the name Rebecca Hutchinson like some famous actress or something? I wouldn't have the like two C's and the two in it, but... Well, yes, but oh no, my phone dung, and I told you there was a reason. Eh, I probably should put it on silent before I get yelled at by the producer. John, you better have your phone off. No, oh, no, it appears Rebecca Hutchinson is an artist. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. um, See, Kansas, Kansas rules. rules. Yeah, but that's it, Colin, it rules so, so much that, that that's why they named that river in Arkansas the Arkansas River. See, I need Will here to back me up. So you were talking about oh. the vans and that. I, I pulled up something here, 11 most influential women in automotive history, and I already don't like it because Hazel's not included on that. How dare they? So Bertha's got to be on there. Who else is on there? Do I need to try to guess and see if I get it right, or are you just going to list it? Um, no, let's see here. I'm only going to do the ones I can pronounce. Um, one, two, and three I can't pronounce. Uh, then, but there's Mary Anderson, um, Bertha Benz is listed at number five, Margaret Wilcox at number six. Okay, number seven doesn't even count. I can pronounce it, but it doesn't even count. Um, I want to know who it is. Danica Patrick. Well, and I uh, guess she does. It, it's very controversial. She's. You know, she did. It, I guess it goes back to what, what did we talk about last week? Um, what what website are you getting this off of? I don't know. BMW.com. Oh, okay. You did do the BMW one? No, that's a shame. Yeah. Uh, uh, Suzanne uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, Charlie Martin. Charlie Martin. Uh, Leah Lombardi. I can't do number 11, so. See, now I would, hmm, well, see, I think this is biased because it's BMW, so it's heavily, um, I would say it's heavily, you know, German. Why did I scroll? There's a whole list of them right there. I was going to say Danica, I guess, pops in there as, um, when we were talking last week about the new rolling 25 year rule and old cars, she did bring a lot of women to the hobby, uh, brought a lot of women to racing. So, but there were, I, but I, guess I, I don't think me, she was one of so the many... top 11 most influential, but she was influential. Right. I mean, there are so many women before her in racing that were brought, I mean, uh, Shirley Madowney. Um, yeah, I'm just like, I'm trying to figure out the way to say this. Shirley Madowney, Lynn St. James, yeah. um, all the all those women that were in racing before her. I mean, when you when you talk to women that are, you know, were essentially kids at the time Shirley Muldowney and Lynn St. James were racing and doing that that's what drew them to automotive, the automotive racing world. I mean, Danica Patrick is like, I think she's maybe between you and me in age. I don't remember how old she is. Um, but 
I just feel like there's that not that she's not influential in racing, that she didn't, you know, do things that she needs and deserves credit for during her time in racing and, and what she's done. But there's certainly women, in my opinion, that should be on that list from racing um, before Danica. And no offense to Danica. I'm not trying to be be rude, but, you know, just I, I don't see where if Danica is going to be on a list, Shirley Muldowney or Lynn St. James should be on that list. Yeah. Well, Colin Howard says she was the most like the most influential racing driver in the world uh, or driver in racing. I but how, uh, how? I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to disagree with that. Unless I got to have the how information. You can't just say that you got to have the how Colin. And if you text me and don't put it in the comments, <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, what Phil commented there about Na- Danica, not exactly having a nice persona. Danica, I met a couple of times at Barber and it really depended on how her weekend was going on, how her mood was going. Um, sometimes she was really, really nice, and sometimes she was not so nice. Um, and it really, like I said, reflected on the way way her weekend was going. So um, yeah, I'm not going to hold that, that against her. I mean, to be honest, I don't care. I want to know if you're a good driver, if you can win a race, um, or I guess, you know, bring in sponsorship. But Well, but here's the thing. I mean, that's that's one thing. But if you're going to be influential in the industry, you have to be more than that. You have to be more than a good driver or somebody that can bring in sponsors. You have to do something that is influential. I mean, you have to do something that um, influences or drives the industry like Bertha Benz, like Hazel, uh, you know, these women that have put hard work. And, and it's hard because you have, uh, you know, a hundred and I mean, we're a hundred and easily 150 years essentially into self-propelled transportation. And you have women all along the way. There are a lot of women that are influential that get well, forgotten in the history books. Well, Colin pops up that, you know, she influenced, you know, in her time, she influenced a lot of young women racing drivers. But I can't come up with the name right now. And I'll look it up if you can't pop it up, Derek. Who were the two or three women that drove cross country in what, 08, 09? You know, Um, a lot lot of press. And I mean, they had to be amazingly influential to women of that time period. Yes. Um, um, You know, they're Alice Ramsey. Mm. The names are escaping me. I know Alice Ramsey is one. Um, the other, the other ones are escaping me right now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there were a ton of women that were doing things like that at the time period. And that's, that's kind of where I was headed, which is what, um, Colin was talking about is, you know, are we looking at through history or are we looking at in the time period of, you know, like present day? Are you going to put Mary Barra on that list? Yeah, you are. You're going to have Mary Barra on the on the list. You're going to have uh, um, is it Elena Ford uh, on that list for what she's doing at Ford Motor Company, and you know you're going to Harriet Quimby for aviation. Good one, Toby. Um, you know, but if you, if you're breaking it down in time period, yes. Um, if you're looking at it as you know influential over the history of the automobile and the most influential women overall i think that list definitely changes and in my opinion i would put again shirley muldowney or lynn st james above danica if we're looking at overall automotive history especially of racing and uh, so that's that's why i would have a hard time you know again we're getting into this we want to talk about the most influential, but now we've got to qualify. How are they influential? Are they into the innovation or are they into the um, promotion? Are they into um, making the companies, operating the companies? Um, according to the article I have in front of me, Toby said Overland. The article I have says Maxwell. Um, I don't know for sure. Said it was a green four-cylinder Maxwell. 
Maxwell DA. What? I can't remember. Q um, Q Q2. That's what I restored is a 1910 Maxwell Q2. Um, um I th Alice, Alice may have driven the Maxwell. Um, there was a woman that drove an Overland though. Yes. Um, I'm just blanking on her name. So I will try to Google it. And so we have some dead air while we're talking about that. So that's okay. We had dead air when we lost you because I had no clue what was going on. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying on I'm drawing blanks. Um, and that I feel I feel horrible about that is um, because there really are so many of them that. Ah, okay. It looks like Toby is saying Dorothy Levitt was the one that drove the Overland. Maybe well, we should, anyway, we should get Toby to call in. <laughs> so, so there were, uh, yeah, there were influential women um, all throughout automotive history. So it's hard to qualify, or it's you know, it's it's hard to determine because you have to have those qualifications and and those categories, if you will. Um, Kind of like a Hall of Fame. You know, you have in the Corvette Hall of Fame, we have three different classes because you have to qualify why they're in the Hall of Fame. You know, are they there for Chevrolet and General Motors being part of the company? Um, all right, Toby, I got some research to do because I can't remember who drove what. Um, but. You know, and then we have a racing category and we have an enthusiast category. So, you know, how you fall into the storyline is a big part of it. But not saying, again, not saying Danica wouldn't, but obviously she's a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A controversial uh, figure in automotive racing history. Even just in her time in racing, she caused a lot of, you know, um, controversy for lack of a better term and uh part of that is is due credit um for her being influential at it during her time all right i'm trying to confirm something here why did jesse combs yeah colin jesse uh I would say Jesse was very, very influential in her time um, and, and what she did in the automotive industry. And obviously her strong, strong will. And I'm trying to think of what I want to say here, um, but her, you know, encouragement of young women to get into the auto industry and, and do you know, what they loved and, and had a passion in. And uh, it's it's a terrible shame that we lost her at such a young age. Um, I think she had a huge career ahead of her. What you looking for, John? Come I'm on. trying to figure out this because the Smithsonian site says Alice drove a, a Maxwell. I have a tendency to believe the Smithsonian, but it's here. Women drive cross-country... I, again, I'm I'm leaning towards and and Toby not to call you out, not to, but I I feel like I recall Alice driving a Maxwell. Yeah, there was a woman who drove an Overland, and I'm just blanking on her name. And unfortunately, when you um, Google women Overland cross country. Um, yeah, Ramsey in 1909 did it in a dark green four-cylinder Maxwell uh, that is now on loan to the LeMay. This is an article from May of uh, this year. Um, I'm not saying she didn't do it a couple of years later in a different car, but I don't know. I, I believe I can have the answer in a moment. Hang on. Boy, we're going a little academic again. Sorry. Does anybody Toby, mind? Does anybody Toby mind? Does anybody? Said it was a Maxwell. Yes, it, it was because they recreated that drive. Uh, and 
um, a woman that I, I am friends with her and her husband um, actually started the trip in a Maxwell and made it most of the, I think about maybe halfway or so, maybe a little less. And unfortunately the Maxwell had an issue and she had to switch into, I think she finished the tour in a model T. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why, um, I kind of thought it was a Maxwell for sure. So, uh, let's see, what was the woman's name that drove? Sorry. I'm asking a friend that should know in a moment who, what her name was. Yeah. Toby admits he did the Ghostbuster theme. He, or, or, he crossed streams. Oh, <laughs> And that's never a good thing when, you know, cross streams. I mean, I can picture the Overland. It was white. It was a, a two-seat kind of roadster with a special deck built on the back. Uh, I mean, I can picture the car in my head. I mean, I've seen it in so many photos, and I just cannot remember the woman's name. Um, but, you know, it, maybe to get – well, it doesn't even get off the academic side of things, but – when you talk about cars that um, are historically significant and have gone around the world or over the, across the country or um, even just historic vehicles that you might own, um, I think one of the cool things about them and, and thinking about what we're talking about right now with women and um, the significant roles they've played and then being academic, uh, you know, tracking the provenance of something. Uh, but the automotive kind of forensics and archaeology that can go into uh, the cars that have actually been used in these uh, trips. I believe Alice Ramsey may have been the first woman inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame. Yeah, I think you're right, Toby. Oh, Jason, you jumped in a little early. I was going to bring Betty Skelton up in a minute. Come on. Give the guy a break. <clears throat> the first woman of firsts. The fastest woman on earth. How many other names you want to throw out or me to throw out about her? Mercury seven and a half. And There's going to be a fantastic. Um, um, who is this uh, Betty Skelton we uh, speak of? Who is but you don't know who Betty Skelton is, John? The first we're, woman. We're, first. we're informing people listening oh, to the show who oh, yeah. gotcha. So Betty Skelton, um, originally a pilot, um, aerobatic pilot, uh, one of the actually the best female aerobatic pilot, and held um the speed record um for aviation for an aircraft, uh, a female aviator speed record 400 some miles an hour uh, ground speed and uh, just incredible at what she did in an aircraft and uh, re Jason we already talked about Bertha move on um, and yes Toby Mercury seven and a half she trained with the astronauts the Mercury seven she was the actually the only woman of the first women to do astronaut training that actually did it with the Mercury seven. The rest of them did it at another location. Um, Betty Skelton herself was actually there with the Mercury seven doing the training. Um, and that was because of Wally Schra. Um, he knew Betty from her flying days and knew she could do it. And he's the one that got her in um, when I think it was life, I can't remember. I think it was Life Magazine wanted to do an article about women possibly going to space. Um, Wally Shira said, I know who we need, and it's Betty Skelton. Because he, yeah, you know, why not get academic, right? Wally Shira was hanging out with friends at a hangar at an airport in Florida one day, and the fog had rolled in, so they weren't going to fly out. They obviously were not going to take off in the fog. And uh, all of a sudden, they're sitting there, and they hear a plane coming in. And obviously flying on instruments only because you couldn't see anything. And this plane comes in, lands, pulls in, pulls up to the hangar, shuts everything down. And this petite little woman gets out and jumps out of the plane and walks in. And here's Betty Skelton um, flying in on instruments only. And that impressed Wally so much. He remembered her 
the rest of his life. Um, and they had stayed in contact and, um, you know, he was just thoroughly impressed by, by Betty as most people should. But after Betty's aviation, after she retires from being the world's greatest aerobatic female pilot, um, the fastest female pilot in an aircraft, she, um, winds up meeting Bill France senior, and Bill France winds up getting her connected with Dodge, and she starts driving Dodge race cars on the beaches at Daytona and uh, jumping boats over uh, Dodge uh, cars. And then she basically goes to Bill France Sr. one day and says, I really don't like the Dodge cars. They're, they're just not... I want to go faster. I want to do... I want, I want, to, I want something better. And uh, Bill France Sr. says, I think I know exactly what you need to do. And Bill picked up the phone and called Zora Arcus Duntoff and put Betty in Corvettes. And that's when she starts setting the records on Daytona Beach um, in the Corvette with Zora and John Fitch driving alongside her. She starts pacing races in Corvettes, um, eventually works for, obviously gets hired by Campbell Ewald to um, run part of the marketing for Chevrolet, which included Corvette. And um, I mean, just lives this incredible life. Um, so she sets uh, speed records on Daytona Beach. She's already the fastest woman alive in an aircraft. Uh, she goes out to Bonneville and gets in um, the Cyclops, um, which is built by Art Arfons, and sets the woman's land speed record at Bonneville. Uh, I mean, she's just this incredible woman that uh, broke all kinds of barriers, but was always, I, I can't say she was always upset or mad, but she always fought against the, um, you know, the male dominant um, stereotype in racing, because even, even at Bonneville, she was upset with Art Arfons and Firestone, who was sponsoring uh, Art Arfons and the, and the Cyclops, because they elected to not turn on the, um, I, I, I think it had a, I can't remember if it was a turbocharger or a supercharger on that car. Um, but they elected to leave it off while Betty drove it so that it didn't have full power. And she was upset because she could have gone faster on the salt flats. Um, so Betty is, is probably, uh, I mean, just one of the women in the industry that, uh, propelled it. So, I mean, so far forward and opened so many doors. So did that help John? But yeah, now you just picked out somebody that probably is a good argument against Danica earlier. Uh, yes, I would say Betty should certainly be on a list before uh, Danica. And the, the crazy thing is, is when she was when she was training with the Mercury 7 um, and they nicknamed her Mercury 7 and a half, um, she actually predicted almost to the day when the first woman would go into space. 20 years after she had done her training, almost to the day, um, a woman went into space and she had predicted it would be almost exactly that amount of time. I'm trying know, to remember. Mind blown, right? Mind <laughs> blown. Yeah. Um, no, it just proves she's so, a woman. There's a, you know, psycho. I mean, oh, psychic. I'm sorry. I get those words confused. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even, wow. Uh, so yeah, a lot of women in the industry and, um, a lot of women that are going to be breaking ground. Um, I think even in the, in the present and near future. I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm not doing well with this topic. No. All right. Well, there's going to be a great documentary coming out on Betty Skelton in from Fox sports. So sometime middle of next year, so keep your eyes open for it. Um, yeah, I'll say that. Well, you want to go into the other topic that I already alluded to and we can talk about is automotive forensics. And, you know, when you have these historic vehicles that are connected to people, even women, um, what it takes to prove or deter, determine uh, if it's the car, if it's not the car, what the car originally looked like and all those things. Well, Cause I know you got stories there, John. Uh, I got a couple little stories here and there. 
Yeah. Go for it. I'll let you start and then I might interject. You know, I, I've got <sighs> one, you know, obviously with the Lotus 10. I've got one with the, the Packard, the 17 Packard that I did. Um, he really is making me carry the show. I yes, see. I am. I just don't feel like yeah. working tonight. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Uh, do we even have any listeners anymore? I mean, how, oh, yeah. how bad is it? Now, yeah. we're, we're not as good as when Will's on, but we're decent. Obviously, everybody likes Will better than us. I'm just... Yeah, and, and remember, most of these people show up during the week. The live people, we keep them up late. You guys don't want to start work till 9 o'clock at night. You know, if we picked up at set eight, maybe we get some more. But you know, the East Coast people are going to bed at ten, and the West Coast yeah. people are still stuck on the four oh five at seven o'clock. So we need to start broadcasting on a radio. We got to get like a serious channel, and we can just broadcast on Sirius. That's you know. Um, actually, I've got an email to send out to somebody similar to that. And remember, we turned down radio early on. Yeah, but that's radio, not serious. Sirius is totally different. Satellite radio. Exactly. You can cuss on satellite radio. You can say things like shit. I've heard it. Uh, you mean I can be like George Carlin? And yeah. Say or uh, because it's not TV. <laughs> yeah. Or what's his face? Uh, uh, the curly hair guy. Um, Carrot top. I like him on his name. No. <laughs> radio personality. Uh Mr. Stern. Yeah, that guy, Howard Stern. Um, yeah. No, but uh, I mean, going back, because you brought up Lotus Skin and even the Hazel thing, um, you know, and Hazel passing away and her influence and all that. But even when we were doing that project, and it, it baffles me how many people want to uh, claim that a car is not the real deal. It, it that that to me is mind blowing. How many times in the museum field um, at Henry Ford Museum, at the Crawford, at the Corvette Museum, um, you know, people come. I mean, people just it's like they want to argue. They're like, oh, well, it's not the real car. Like, what? Why would we have it if it's not the real deal? Like, why? And and if we if we knew it was not the real car, we we admit that it's a replica. Uh, that's what museums do. But a, a number of cars at Henry Ford museum, people would be like, Oh, that's not the real one. Like what? And they did that with the, the Jim Clark Lotus. And, uh, you know, through a lot of research, a lot of digging through archives, looking at the car, taking the car apart, mind you finding the original USAC stamp on the engine um, that had never come apart. Um, you know, we were able to prove all that using forensics, you know, finding the original paint underneath some of the cork insulation for the, um, coolant pipes that run under the monocoque, which I'm sure you're familiar with those, John, um, you know, just, you know, taking the time to prove that something is the real deal and can represent history is uh, extremely important. And whether it's it's a historically significant car like the Type 38 Lotus, um, like some of the cars John's worked on, the Packard Old Pacific at the Henry Ford, or even just your own personal car that's, you know, an uh, older car and figuring out what the original paint scheme was and, and all those things. Because you got to remember at one point, the, you know, there was no such thing as a body trim tag uh, that told you, all the codes of what the original paint color was and all that, you know, you get far enough back, you got to do some research. Well, we did a um, exhibit. I'm really kind of proud that we did at Barber's using a, a Lotus 12 that we acquired and it had been completely restored. Lotus 12 was the first single seat race car out of Lotus. And we had this car that had been vintage raced and had been, you know, basically completely restored. And when we purchased the car, guess what we got with it? The original body and the original frame. Because the car being raced had a new frame. <laughs> the car being raced had a new body. And we did a um, very careful preservation um, to that original frame and to that original body. 
Uh, you can even go to Metal Rescue's website and you can see some of the treatments we did to try to keep the original paint that was on that because, you know, the the frame had pretty much been sandblasted and marked up the original, but there were still some original paint areas left that kind of showed the more of a robin's egg blue rather than a gray, which is what uh, Lotus painted all of their frames. Uh, we had all the little pen marks and measurements off the original body for when they made the second body for the way the car raced um, in, you know, vintage times. I mean, it made perfect sense being a vintage race car. The frame, that the original frame would not have been safe to race with. But, we, you know, we, we ended up displaying the car and then directly above it, the original frame and the uh, directly above it, the original body. And it's kind of an explanation of, you know, it's one of the things that drives you crazy, Derek, in that when you go to restore a car, you replace this, you replace that. And when you're done, nothing is that original car. And that's exactly the same thing with this 12. I can't, I can't tell you if the motor was the original. I don't believe it was. So the car that was being raced under whatever chassis number was not the car that was built in, you know, 1958. Uh, you know, we did that. We had so we had that exhibit kind of highlighting, you know, why we make some of our restoration choices. Um, you know, and then I had my 17 Packard Cloverleaf Roadster that I restored. You know, it's one of eight. This one was owned by a railroading family, and they would load it up on their train as they went all over the Northwest you know, various places and they would get it off and that's what they would use. And you know, when I got it, quite possible, it still had some of that uh, original Yellowstone mud on it from when, you know, it was there. Because uh, the, the guy who gave it to us was the second owner for the restoration and he claimed he never washed the thing, you know, and he bought it in the 50s. So who knows? But in 17, because of the war effort, car companies stopped nickel plating a lot of the trim on their car. So 17 Packards had black headlight bezels, say. Um, the funny thing is, these original headlight bezels on this car, they were black, painted over a nickel headlight bezel. So, you know, it kind of tells that little story that, yeah, we're, 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 you know, dealing with the war effort and we're supporting, but, well, we had these leftover headlight bezels from 16, so we're just going to paint them black and go with that story. And it's, let's say, it's part of the fun I always had with restoration is learning the history, learning learning the real stories behind things. Um, you know, and unfortunately, so many of those die with us restorers because, you know, they don't get told and nobody wants to document that stuff because it's controversial and I guess I just documented it here on forever for this podcast, as long as the internet survives. Which What's will be until next week. <laughs> Could be. What's another one of your good um, things you've uncovered over the years, Derek, in a restoration or in the museum world? Or Oh, wow. Um, well, obviously, you know, proving that the Jim Clark Lotus in the Henry Ford yeah, 100% truly was the the Jim Clark Lotus. The controversy came from the fact that Ford, um, of course, when that car won, Ford took ownership of it. That was part of the deal. Uh, but they took another, the the basically the backup car that was at Indy, the car that didn't, never ran. Obviously, there was Jim Clark and, and um, Bobby Johns. Uh, there was a backup car that never ran. They took that car and painted it to look like the Jim Clark car so that they would have two that could go around the show circuit and be on show as the winning Lotus from, you know, Ford and Lotus. Um, so that that's what caused some of the controversy with that car, but finding that the car had the original engine with the USAC stamp number that matched and um, all the details we found to prove it was the Jim Clark car was, was kind of cool, but uh, even with, with the Packard old Pacific that's at Henry Ford museum, you know, you can, you can go up to it. And if you look close enough on the wood spoke wheels, you can actually see where the tire chains that they use to cross country, um, 
you know, actually dug into the wood spoke wheels and left notches. And, and then I noticed when we got the car into the conservation lab, when I was going to get it running, that the, the car seemed to just have this lean to it. It it just in the front, it kind of leaned to the left. And I was always baffled by that. But while I was reading um, Tom Fetch's diary and an account of the trip, um, I, I came across an entry where he was talking about fording a creek uh, in the mountains. And as he went into the creek, he didn't realize that there was a very large, um, deep pocket <laughs> and the left front wheel fell into it and basically bent the suspension and bent the car just a little bit. And he literally wrote something to the effect of the car never sat right after that. It always leaned to the left. And to this day, the car still has that lean in it. Um, and it's all those little things that kind of prove the details um, of of what car you're working on. And, uh, you know, John, what I said in the pre-show, even when it comes down to a car that's not necessarily historically significant, but just a collector car, um, the reason this is kind of hot in my mind right now is I'm in the midst of restoring my 1917 Model 90 Overland uh, Roadster. It's one of about maybe six or seven that are, are known left in existence, but it happens to be the lowest serial number. Um, left in existence. So a very early one. Uh, Model 90 Roadsters are a slightly modified version of the Model 75 Roadster, Roadster that existed in 1916. One of the big differences is the Model 75s were painted maroon, uh, a kind of a red maroon color. And in, in 17, when they went to the Model 90, they painted them a, a really quite beautiful dark green. And ever since I bought the car and started working on it, everybody's like, oh, you got to, you know, the, the dark green, the dark green, the dark green. Well, you know, my dad has been stripping the body up at his, the, the restoration shop uh, back home. And we can't find a lick of green paint on it anywhere. Uh, but there are signs of red paint on it. And so we're starting to believe that it's one of the transition cars from the 75 to the 90 it actually has model 75 springs on it actually stamped 75 and uh, we're we're starting to believe that the body actually was maroon instead of green uh, just because of the forensic evidence that's showing up and and studying the car and i guess for me it's one of those things where don't just believe uh, you know what history has written down i mean we can see that in the model t Oh, uh, you could have a Model T as long as it's black. Every Model T was black. No, no, they they weren't all black until late 13. Um, and even at that, it's a really dark blue when it first starts. It moves into black, you know, sometime right around the transition to 14. And uh, then in 26, they go back to having colors again. Um, so don't believe it just because it's what everybody says. Look at the evidence. It's all, uh, yeah, like I say, that it's always fun. Like I said, the Lotus 10 was uh, another challenge we had with, with colors and trying to figure it out. And it, it you know, by the time we got it, it had been painted green because hell, every Lotus is green. Um, and I eventually found a little bit of red paint on it, and then using the um. Revs Institute archives, I actually found a couple pictures of the car racing. You know, two or three pictures and was able to colorize the photo fairly accurately. And it proved that that car was actually originally red. And that's the way it sits in the, the Barber Museum correct collection now is a, a deep, deep, um, probably maroons, the more accurate color. I did want to ask you, Derek, completely changing subject. We're good um, at that here. Yes. We probably should have brought this up in the beginning because it would have been exciting and people would have hung around. Of course, Jason wouldn't have been here for us to bring it up because he's the one who pointed it out. Did you get a chance to watch American Auto yet? Oh, I have not. Didn't he just literally text us about that last night? Um, Tuesday at 7, 10 a.m. is when I responded. So it was Monday night that he texted us about it. Okay, well, I may have had something else going on um, called um, disaster recovery from a tornado. 
Um, so I have got, you've got a smartphone. You can watch it while you're commuting. <laughs> oh. um, let's just put that anybody who's out there. I want to talk about this show next week. We'll be four episodes into it next week. It is available on Peacock streaming. Um, I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying and it's And he's bad. not saying it's bad. Jason's kind of right. It's kind of like The Office. It really has somebody that reminds me of um, this guy that replaced Michael Scott. Alex Adam. I can't think of what it was. I wasn't a big Office fan. Um, interesting storylines. And I don't know if it's because they're cheap. Or if the producers really dislike Chrysler automobiles. But yeah, that you're gonna find out what the um and I I'm not even gonna tell you the name of the car company they're using, but mm, they're interesting, but and I really do like the prototype that comes out in episode number two. I thought it was kind of interesting. But I also do think they need to get a car guy on their production team. Um, it's definitely written by Hollywood people that have no clue about automobiles. So anybody who's out there, anybody who listens, we're going to talk about this next week. I'm going to write it down here on one of my many notes. And uh, American Auto will be one of the subjects we talk about next week. Um, if we get Will, we might either talk about what we wanted for Christmas and you would have two days to hopefully not FedEx it, especially to me since I'm go through the Bessemer hub for FedEx packages. Amazon uh, prime baby. Yeah. Um, it, Amazon gift cards will work for all of us. Exactly. But we should be here. We should, we'll be here next week for you. And the full intention is also to hit the week after Christmas and uh, right, ride this all the way through the end of the year. But with that, Derek, I'm going to probably close out the show unless you have something revolutionary or something that reminded or, you know, should be said. Tires. One of our listeners, I know son had a birthday. I'll throw that out there. Say hey, happy, happy birthday. birthday. And uh, one of our good listeners, we won't do that to just anybody. If you buy us a coffee. Yeah, we probably will say happy birthday if we find out. Just so maybe. go to the website, nodrivinggloves.com. You can buy us a coffee, throw us a couple of bucks if you actually think what we talked about was worth something. Um, you can find all of our back episodes. If you really want to learn anything about Derek, Will, or I, there's 200 hours of us there being more entertaining than we were tonight, hopefully. Hey, so, some on. nights even worse. But, <laughs> <sighs> but with that, I'm... I'm I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to finish enjoying my bottle of wine. All right. Hey, don't forget tires are revolutionary. They're also round and I need to buy one. Just one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. We're out of here. Good night.